So welcome everybody. My name's Alex. I'm in charge of the speaker series for the Colorado Field Ornithologists. I'd like to welcome you here tonight. We've got a few more people trickling in. Um, so just to remind you, we've got another speaker in February. Dr. Rich Reading is going to be talking about the vultures in Africa. And that is, let me check my notes, February 19th. Uh, but tonight we have Anton. Um, Anton's a float keeper at the Denver Zoo. He's worked with birds, carnivores, a variety of species of animals. Um, for a long time, he was a bird keeper, taking care of flamingos and raptors. He's worked with raptor rescue. Um, he's worked with animals in South Africa and the Bahamas. Um, and he's a wonderful photographer as well. So we'll, hopefully we'll get to see some of that tonight. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Anton. Anton, please. All right. Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So uh, just a brief introduction um, kind of to what I'll be talking about is Denver Zoo is in a really cool location um, in Denver with all of the water and different habitats. Um, within City Park. Um, and because birds can fly, um, sometimes we have to remember that even though we have a lot of barriers for ourselves, um, those barriers don't exist for most of our bird friends. And so um, Denver Zoo, Denver City Park, sometimes I like to consider those as one um, big habitat. Um, and so some of my pictures are, the majority of my pictures are going to be from right within the zoo gates, and then some are going to be um, right outside of those gates. Um, but Alex kind of did a brief introduction um, about my past. I thought I'd um, really talk about two uh, groups of animals that uh, made a really big difference in my life. Um, actually, most of my life, I really could care less about birds. Um, I was very carnivore centric. Um, wolves are what made me want to work with animals. I liked cats, dogs, bears. Um, and all through school, that was my goal. Um, and then even after working at the zoo and even after um, working with birds, I still um, wanted to work with mammals, specifically rhinos at the time. And a bunch of events happened that kind of changed my pathway and made me really fall in love with birds. So um, one of those things was meeting um, flamingo up close at work. Um, you can see that right in the center picture, that's a mott. And she's a pretty famous flamingo in Denver because uh, she likes every human, which is not very usual for flamingos. Um, and so she actually does uh, meet people during non-bird flu seasons. Um, and she is what really changed my life um, and made me a very flamingo-centric person. So um, I've worked with flamingos in the Bahamas. I've raised flamingos at Denver Zoo. I helped in a flamingo rescue and rehabilitation project in South Africa, and I've been lucky to see uh, flamingos in the wild in Spain, Mexico, um, the US, and in South Africa. So flamingos were a really big um, deal for me and what kind of changed my pathway of wanting to work with carnivorous mammals. Um, the other thing that really changed my life um, was seeing snowy owls in Colorado. I know it can be very controversial for people to go seeking snowy owls um, or other owls, but in 2012, I was lucky, um, just a friend brought me along to see a snowy owl at DIA. And then um, randomly we saw a snowy owl in Pawnee National Grasslands a few months later. Um, and then five um, years later, I was lucky to see another snowy owl um, behind my uh, roommate's parents' house. So snowy owls were the wild bird species that um, really changed my life. And uh, raptors in general, all the owls um, have, been what has promoted me to go um, and adventure in birding all around the world. Um, so when it comes to the zoo, um, something that we often will talk about at work is um, people, normal people is what I call them, um, don't usually come to the zoo to see um, all the little um, species. Um, Denver Zoo is home to about 300 different types of birds right now. Um, at one point uh, before our bird world building closed in 2019, we were um, home to over 500 individual birds. And um, even though we had over 500 individual birds, 
people want to see parrots, people want to see penguins, people want to see flamingos, and people want to see birds of prey, which are honestly my favorite types of bird too. Um, but something that I wish people um, looked at more was the details of all of the birds. Um, and that's why I kind of um, stuck with birds even after um, falling in love with flamingos is that uh, mammal keepers often only work with a few species, whether you're a pachyderm keeper and you work with um, you know, an elephant all day or you work with a couple of um, rhinos and hippos, bird keepers will often work with dozens and dozens of species um, by themselves in one day. And that biodiversity um, and just seeing all those differences in different species and different individuals um, is something that is really important to me. And it's something that I really like our guests to learn about. Um, so we also have being an urban location, a bunch of these birds, which um, I know are not necessarily the birds that we um, always like to see, um, but something um, about these birds being in such big numbers at our zoo is that we have um, a big population of Cooper's hawks and we have falcons um, that stick around because of all of these birds. And um, even though I don't necessarily want there to be a lot of these, uh, sometimes they do attract um, some cool species. Um, I brought these on the presentation because I think a lot of times when people um, who haven't been fully um, introduced to birding, when they think about wild birds, these are the types of birds that they think about. Um, pigeons and sparrows, starlings, those birds that they see every day, you know, mallards and Canada geese, um, they often aren't aware of the diversity that's around them. And sometimes you just have to point out um, that there are these really cool birds next to them that they've just been blind to their whole lives. And I was definitely one of those um, people for a good portion of my, of my life. And now I'm happy that I see and hear things that I didn't um, see and hear before. Um, so habitat diversity within city park, like it said, is really um, cool and crazy for how urban Denver is. And we have um, a bunch of different habitats related to water and trees, these wooded areas, um, different grasses, and then the um, gardens that we purposely place um, throughout city park and the zoo are really important habitats to a bunch of different bird species, especially during um, the winter season and definitely during migration. Um, so I was looking at eBird and um, there have been 125 species recorded just at the Denver Zoo hotspot, which is um, very wild to me. Denver Zoo is 80 acres. Um, and I can't say that I've ever seen 125 species, um, even though I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens and it changes all the time. Um, but that just goes to show you how those 80 acres are really important. And I would really like to secure more space um, within the zoo, within City Park to help all of those species. Um, so this is just a little uh, fun quiz for you at home. You don't actually have to answer. Um, but this is a species I uh, see almost every day. Um, so if you uh, know what that species is, um, I'll reveal it um, after this song. Um, this was actually taken just on one of my walks between um, my round to the office to one of my um, animal areas. And it's um, a species that I really like to show people just because they are tiny, and if you don't listen, if you don't look for them, you probably won't see them. Um, but they are um, literally all around us uh, within City Park at all times. So uh, we have so many bush tits at Denver Zoo, and um, they are one of my favorite passerine species uh, because they are so tiny, because they live in such big groups. Um, and so, like I said, they are one of those species that I make sure to point out to people. Um, and I also just like the fact that um, males and females have different eye colors, like a lot of birds. Um, and you spark those questions with guests, with um, even other staff members about how crazy it would be if humans' eyes um, were like that, where um, boys' eyes were one color and girls' eyes were one color. They start thinking about other things that they've never thought about and then bush tits stick in their head. Uh, so if you have been to Denver Zoo um, and City Park, um, we have two big lakes um, in City Park. And Duck Lake is the smaller lake that is directly adjacent to Denver Zoo. 
and actually has kind of a funny um, borderline um, and technically uh, part of the island and part of the lake is actually um, technically the Zeus and the other half is the city of Denver's. Um, but because uh, we have a bigger half of the island, Denver Zoo does a lot of the um, regulation um, of this island and it's full of wild birds. It's the fourth largest cormorant rookery in the state. So if you um, want a good look at cormorants, especially during the spring when they're building their nests and um, laying their eggs, raising their babies, um, I think it's a really cool spot just because it's so close to um, the pathway and it's just so busy. Um, but not only are there cormorants, there are black crowned night herons, there are snowy egrets, sometimes um, you'll see uh, cattle egrets um, and a bunch of other species. And something that we have to be careful about um, in an urban situation with having so many birds um, in an area like that, uh, besides um, the, the threat of bird flu like everywhere in the Western world now, um, we have to worry about things about like botulism. And so uh, Denver Zoo actually helps to make sure that um, this island stays um, clean. Um, if we have deceased birds, we make sure that we um, can dispose of those and make those birds have a safe and clean environment, um, mostly in the summertime. And thankfully in recent years, uh, we've been working with USDA. And so uh, most of their staff are the ones who um, handle this. Um, but historically, and still sometimes, um, it's uh, Denver Zoo bird keepers who will go out onto this island and just make sure it's clean. Um, and we also will um, often do counts. Um, so we make sure um, that these nests and the number of eggs and the number of cormorants coming back every year um, is counted so we can look at any trends. And um, recently, I don't think there have been too many crazy trends in the cormorants. They're pretty resilient, um, but it's good information to have. Um, something really cool within the zoo is that we have an overlook um, that actually was just recently redone. Um, it was made really nice and it now has a pathway um, for small school groups or for special um, trips like birding trips um, where we can bring people um, kind of close to um, this island in a safe manner and we can bring scopes, we can bring binoculars and we can just kind of see what is out on that island, um, see what's out in the water. And depending on the season, um, you're gonna obviously see different things. Um, so it is called Duck Lake for a reason. Um, so there um, are lots of ducks there. Um, something that I really like about there is uh, you can walk by there in the morning and then in the evening and then the morning next day. And each time you walk by, there are going to be different types of birds. And so it's one of the spots that I really like to bring new birders to because um, if you're trying to learn ducks, if you're trying to learn um, other water birds like those cormorants, those herons, those egrets, it's a really cool place to try and capture them all in a short period of time and then in different seasons. Um, so like I said previously, um, there are lots of different species and uh, something that I always like to keep a lookout um, during these times are, um, like I said, a variety of ducks. But then you also get really cool um, species like snow geese who will fly over to the city park golf course. Um, again, another part of um, the city park area um, that is actually a habitat to a lot of these birds um, that is important for the birds to eat on. And then they come and use the water um, within Duck Lake on the Denver Zoo side. So again, it's all connected. These animals can fly, even though we have barriers for ourselves, um, they don't see them. And, um, that's really important in um, conserving them. So uh, we did have a pollinator um, pathway um, that opened um, probably about five years ago. Um, unfortunately, our bird world building um, was shut down. And so a large portion, uh, my favorite portion of the pollinator pathway um, was actually um, destroyed. Um, but I'm hoping that with our new habitat, which will be Australia theme, we will be um, redoing it. Um, the woodland part and um, some of the meadow areas um, still are intact. And so we do still have a large portion of um, habitat that's just for people to relax and for wildlife. Um, and we have ponds within the zoo surrounded by cottonwoods and um, willows 
and different types of um, shrubs and things like that that um, provide food for a lot of these birds throughout the, the winter. And then um, also for birds during migration. So during migration, it's a big hot spot and we'll see um, lots of different types of species uh, from waterfowl to passerines and then the raptors that are eating them. Um, so something really cool is we do have um, specific um, areas displayed and you can um, track how people um, look at our signage and um, to see kind of how they are experiencing the zoo and what actions they are taken because of their experience at the zoo. And um, that's what we're really trying to do at Denver Zoo is we're trying to inspire um, communities um, to save these species, to save these habitats with the knowledge that people are gonna come first um, in the world we live in, whether you're conserving species in other countries or within um, the US right here in Denver, uh, people are going to be the first priority. Um, but if we can get people to care about these things, if we can get communities to change their ideas, then maybe we can get them to um, change their homes, change their lawns into gardens, change their um, schools into having gardens or special habitats talk about bird feeders, talk about nectar, talk about water baths, um, and just get people um, interested in how they can help uh, right in their own backyards. Um, so these are all species that I have seen uh, from within um, Denver Zoo grounds, which is really cool. Um, I have seen many, many, many more. Uh, right now, the cedar waxwings um, seem to be doing really well. Um, but what I love is um, how many different species uh, just call Denver Zoo home. They leave, a lot of them come back. There are certain individuals, um, I'll talk about them more later, uh, where we have suspicions that it's the same individuals year after year who are leaving and then they're coming back to um, have their kids and raise their kids right in this urban habitat, um, which I love um, so much. And I really wanna share this biodiversity at Denver Zoo uh, with the Denver community and just with everyone who's interested. Um, something that I, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been involved with are Christmas bird counts. And Denver Zoo has been involved with um, a Christmas bird count uh, for over 30 years. And um, there have been hundreds of species documented on Christmas bird counts. I have been helping to lead these Christmas bird counts for um, probably about six or seven years now, um, which is crazy. And um, I think it's also crazy how um, different things are depending on how the weather is. So not just the season, but living in Colorado, just whether it's cold or hot or snowy, um, that really has shown um, differences in our, our bird counts. Um, and it was one of the initial projects of birding that um, really got me into wanting to expand the surveys and getting people involved at Denver Zoo. Um, Christmas bird count has just been such a tradition. I was like, why aren't we doing this, you know, outside of um, the Christmas bird count uh, timeframe? If you bird in the spring, if you bird in the summer, it's going to be very different. Um, why are we not keeping track of um, those other um, seasons? So, um, that has led to other discussions and um, happily um, things are changing and um, we are starting to um, you know do surveys and get people interested for other seasons. Um, our Christmas bird count is very similar to um, any of the bird counts in the United States. We do it on the same day um, as all of the other um, Denver birders and Historically, our bird counts have been led by one or two staff members, and then it has mostly been um, a group of volunteers who uh, usually come back um, year after year because it's a tradition for them now, which has been really fun. Um, but I really want to get um, not just volunteers, but I want to get our staff interested. So our staffs have something to look forward to, to be excited about. And um, I think birding for Christmas bird count and then outside of that is um, something that will be really good for not only conservation, but for um, team building and collaboration to have those bonds um, over a common hobby, but then use that common hobby to help birds. Um, Denver Zoo is also 
I think I said 80 acres. And so um, we usually have to split up um, to cover um, the zoo because it is a pretty big area. Um, it usually takes us about an hour and a half to two hours to cover the whole area. Uh, so this was um, not a recent um, Christmas bird count, but this was a photo from um, 2022. Um, and this is in that um, pathway by Duck Lake that I was talking about, um, which has been renovated to make it easier for groups to go out and get good looks at birds, which is really exciting. Um, always with the Christmas bird count, it's um, fun to find rarities. Um, and so uh, most years we have found rarities. We didn't find any for our 2023 um, bird count. It was uh, pretty much things you'd expect um, for our survey this year. Um, but a few years ago, um, and it has appeared a couple times, um, we have seen greater white fronted goose um, at the zoo, um, which has, have been kind of cool. Uh, our elephants and rhinos actually have um, hot tubs. Um, so in the winter time, a lot of the waterfowl um, like to go spend their time in those um, hot tubs because they don't freeze over like Duck Lake and a lot of the surrounding areas. So uh, somewhere we always look is the the Toyota Elephant Passage hot tubs. Um, that's where we saw one of these greater white fronted geese um, before he went to go um, get some lunch in the grass. Um, something I also really loved was a few years back, we had a Criders red-tailed hawk um, that kind of stumped us while we were um, in the survey, um, but we figured out after what it was. And um, he just was hanging out right above our train railroad track. He didn't care at all and just let everyone watch him um, just right in the middle of our, our public pathway, which was really cool. Um, so Denver Zoo is accredited by the Associations of Zoos and Aquarium, and the zoos, Associations of Zoos and Aquariums um, have come out with um, the saving, animal, um, saving Animals from Extinction projects that are called SAFE projects, and they are devoting um, a lot of money to these SAFE projects, and more and more keep coming up um, every year. So like California condors have a SAFE. Um, whooping cranes have a safe project, Andean highland flamingos have a safe project, and then there are a lot of mammals that you would expect to have um, safe projects, um, such as lions or tigers, um, pandas, things like that. Um, but something that is really cool um, it, that we're hoping to get more involved with, and um, we do have two representatives of the North American Songbird um, Safe Projects or Zoo, is getting our staff more involved directly um, in this conservation initiative, um, whether it's resources or um, manpower in providing um, numbers for doing more work with identification, census, habitat um, changing, and um, figuring out ways of reducing uh, bird window collisions. And so um, we do have a director of welfare and research at our zoo who is a part of this um, panel of people taking action for North American songbirds. And one of my goals is to get more people from our staff and more volunteers from our staff equipped with the knowledge uh, to be able to help this project and to help North American songbirds, as well as all the other types of birds at Denver Zoo. Um, so something that we have been a part of um, in recent years um, is Black Birders Week. And Black Birders Week came about um, after an incident in 2020 um, and it has really been an event to um, be more inclusive, to create safe spaces for birding for everyone. Um, and what is really cool is that um, a lot of our bird keepers at Denver Zoo um, are bir birders and they are black. And so we have been able to uh, provide events by collaborating with Denver Audubon and um, Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, and we've been able to do um, birding tours in a safe setting where it's free to come in, free to learn about birds, um, and, um, you know, just create a community um, at Denver Botanic Gardens and at Denver Zoo, and hopefully um, we'll also be uh, participating in that event this year. Um, I've met a lot of people um, who are now people I can chat with and who are people in this community I didn't know were interested in the same things as me um, with that diversity, with that inclusion and in creating a bigger um, group and making sure that um, kids see people who look like them um, 
you know, doing this hobby. Um, it's not necessarily um, historical for African Americans to um, be a part of this community. Um, and so it's really cool to find out that there are others and that we can get kids into this and show them how cool birding is. Um, and something also really important to me is making sure that people um, get to use good binoculars because uh, sometimes when you don't have the right um, optics, um, you can't see things as well as um, you would like. And um, I think good binoculars are really important. And we were able to let these people see birds um, with really good optics, which I think is important. Um, something really cool about these events also is that because a lot of us um, also work with birds at the zoo, we have been able to show them some of our non-releasable birds, um, such as um, Slash, which you can see uh, Kristen holding right here. Um, and what was really cool about this day was they these people got to meet a red-tailed hawk up close, learn all about red-tailed hawks, um, hear what a red-tailed hawk sounds like, and then we went birding and we actually found a red-tailed hawk um, nest. And so they actually got to see a wild red-tailed hawk on a nest with babies after seeing a red-tailed hawk um, up close for the first time, which was really cool. Uh, something super, super new, which is the thing I'm actually most excited about that we were able to start um, last year um, is Denver Zoo has been very supportive in um, creating different employee connection and um, different employee resource groups. And they have them for um, all kinds of different things, um, whether it's for Spanish speakers, um, for people who are uh, LGBTQ+, um, for parents, uh, for people who like to hike. Um, we got permission to create one for birding. Um, so now staff are allowed to uh, join our group. We call it Birds with uh, DZ, um, just because we're uh, punny um, acronym people at Denver Zoo. Um, but we actually are allowed to devote up to two hours of our paid time um, to an ECG or to an ERG. And so um, we actually have people now who are interested in learning how to bird and learning how to use binoculars and learning how to identify birds and they get paid for it. So it's something to get excited about. Um, a lot of these people didn't know each other before um, this group was created. And so now we have friends. And then we also now have this group of people who can also do things like go to bird festivals together or um, you know, go hiking and uh, looking for birds at state parks. So um, this part has been really exciting. Um, we just did our first um, outing um, pretty recently. And I was really excited because we were able to find um, yellow-throated sparrows with, within the zoo, which I had never seen before. Um, so the fact that it was our first outing and um, these people got a bunch of new species and I got a new lifer uh, was really cool. Um, something that I hope to transform this into, and I actually have a meeting with our director of research and Welf welfare, is uh, we want to develop people's skills in bird identification and um, in getting censuses and, you know, teaching them how to use Merlin and use eBird um, so that they can be the people who help with that North American songbird project, who can help um, with running different uh, tours for Migratory Bird Day. Or um, we also have a project on the South Platte where we um, work with CSU Spur in getting data for citizen science um, with birding. So um, it's a really good crew and I'm really excited for uh, what we're gonna be able to do. Uh, so something that I don't know if people are aware of um, with our native birds at Denver Zoo um, is we have a brand new hospital and all of our bird staff and all of our veterinary staff are trained how to um, assess birds, and handle birds. Um, we are a licensed rehab, so we can't do rehabilitation long-term. Um, but what we can do is provide temporary care and then get birds um, to where they need to go. And um, I used to volunteer with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife um, Wildlife Transportation Team. And so I will often get calls from people just because they know that I really enjoy helping with rehab um, birds. Um, but this red-tailed hawk actually last year um, was a bird um, that was injured 
and we were able to, um, you know, get him into a dark, safe place in our ICU, give him fluids, make sure that he was okay. Um, and he stayed with us for a night before I took him to the Birds of Prey Foundation. I got to see all of his intake stuff. And then I kept in contact with them the whole time. Um, so we got updates constantly and the veterinary staff and bird staff at Number Zoo was uh, really glad to get those updates. And um, we actually heard that he was released in September, right before the um, next big wave of bird flu. Um, because of bird flu, um, things have become a lot more complicated with our interactions with wild birds. Um, we have to be a lot more careful and wildlife rehabilitation centers have to be a lot more careful. Um, but I'm hoping that our uh, relationship with the wildlife just constantly expands because um, I think we have the, the, the resources to, you know, keep helping these animals ride on our property um, and get them to where they need. And these are the three rehabs we mostly work with. Um, but uh, we have worked with people um, even further um, if we need to get animals to a, to a proper place to be rehabilitated. Um, another thing that we're working with that is um, related to a bunch of those things is um, Denver Zoo is involved in the City of Denver Lights Out program. And um, even before being involved directly with that program, we were already doing our own monitoring and surveys of where birds hit windows and we were researching what to do about that. So um, we do have um, a lot of data that shows that there are certain windows that birds were just naturally more attracted to. And we have um, you know, committed to changing those. So even if it doesn't look pretty, um, we try to find the prettiest way of doing it. But more importantly, we just wanna reduce those bird strikes. Um, a lot of times, like with that hermit thrush, um, you find them um, kind of in shock or passed out and uh, we're able to give them that supportive care, give them those fluids and then just release them right outside the door. Um, the poor will um, at the bottom was actually a bird uh, that flew into our gift shop um, during migration. And uh, we had to try and capture this um, bird who just couldn't figure out what a window was. Um, thankfully, the bird didn't have any um, major injuries. We were able to get it back into a camouflage place, and then um, we actually watched it fly away, and it looked really good. So um, we're going to hopefully continue on um, with this Lights Out program, and hopefully those people who are part of that um, employee connection group that I talked about um, will be excited and help in joining the City of Denver Lights Out program, um, where we actually, um, you know, do research and surveys on where birds are hitting windows um, with buildings all throughout Denver. Um, so unlike other departments, um, like bird people don't call when raccoons uh, are you know, within the zoo, we don't call the raccoon keepers, but uh, everyone in the zoo seems to call us with all of their bird problems. And uh, we're always happy to help out, whether it's um, baby animals that just need to help to get back to their, their parents, or if we do have orphans like the this woodpecker, um, we knew for a fact that um, both of its parents had died. Um, and so we were able to um, get it out of the nest and uh, get it out to where it needed to be. And um, it got released into the wild, which was really cool. Uh, we also have um, a few residents that are birds that were injured in the wild and are non-releasable. Um, so we have two bald eagles at Denver Zoo, um, two and O, who is what we call our exhibit bald eagle. If you have ever visited Denver Zoo, um, he's the one you have probably um, seen the most. Um, he lives right next to the condors um, and the flamingos. And two and O um, is a West Nile virus survivor and has permanent neurological damage. Um, so he actually came uh, from a rehabilitation center um, in Oregon almost 15 years ago. Uh, they tried to um, get him back to a point to be released back into the wild, but he kept failing his hunting test. And so they deemed him non-releasable. Um, and so he's been living at Denver Zoo ever since. Um, he was believed to be about five or six years old when he came in. So um, he's in his twenties now. Um, the one next to him is Valor and Valor was actually a gunshot um, survivor. I don't know why anyone would shoot a bald eagle. Um, but Valor survived and um, he is a part of our animal ambassador program. So he's actually um, learning how to get used to being around people. 
um, and hopefully we'll be um, in close contact um, with people in the near future. Um, something really cool about the bald eagles that we have is we are licensed to uh, collect their feathers and then we are able to give them um, to the um, bald eagle uh, repository um, so that indigenous tribes are able to have those feathers. So even though they are in human care, um, teaching people about bald eagles and that successful comfort conservation story, um, they are directly still helping um, the indigenous community uh, just by molting those feathers. Um, we also have Slash. Um, he is a non-releasable red-tailed hawk who is actually an imprint um, from people uh, bringing a baby red-tailed hawk um, into their home and feeding him the wrong things and uh, making him not afraid of people. Um, Slash does lots of programs and um, is a bird that we are able to free fly um, because he is imprinted. He doesn't have those injuries um, that keep him from flying um, like Valor and Tuno, um, but he um, loves, loves his people. Um, so he always comes back home, but it's really cool. Like I said, for black birders week, where you can show them a red tailed hawk up close, um, and then show them red tailed hawks in the wild. Um, Denver zoo, because of all of the water also has a lot of, um, birds that, um, come and go, like I said, and, um, to the right, you'll see this, um, female bald eagle, um, who has a bunch of names, but she comes back and hangs out in the same tree every single year. I've seen her um, for I don't know how many years now, and I just assume that it's the same one because it always looks the same, but she's giant, she's beautiful, and she's in love with both of our eagle bo boys, which is kind of cool. You'll uh, see her fly between both of them, and she'll vocalize and um, then she goes hunting and you can find her all over the zoo, whether it's above the water. Sometimes she just hangs out right outside of our office doors. So you'll walk outside and there's just a bald eagle um, standing really close to you, like in this picture, um, which is just really cool that um, she survived this long um, with um, going back and forth to wherever she goes to and then back to the zoo. Um, so with all of what I've just said, um, my long-term goals are just to um, get all of our different departments um, to work together, whether it's people who um, are in charge of the learning or the guest experience part, um, our animal teams, our conservation teams, um, just to bring the public um, and then our staff into birding and getting them introduced to that. Um, but I really wanna get young people and then non-historic populations into birding and um, show them how fun it can be and just show them all those things that they are missing, which I was missing for a long time until um, people kind of showed me and um, taught me how to listen. Um, because I think once you learn about those birds, you start seeing everything different, whether it's plants, whether it's mammals, whether it's water, whether it's different cultures, I think birds are really good at showing you the details so that you can look at the details and other things. Um, I really want to create more safe spaces for birds and also for people to see those birds. And something really cool is we have a very supportive um, curator of horticulture now who really likes birds and is taking a less traditional approach and um, what has historically been um, the way we've managed things. And I'm really excited because I think she is the type of person who would create lots of different microhabitats for birds all around the zoo, off grounds, um, and wherever anyone would let her. So um, I'm hoping to get more involved with the horticulture department because I think habitat um, is one of the big players for our, our birds. Um, I want to use those um, community connections just to make birding more fun and hopefully to have people see birding as fun but then use it as um, a way of getting them involved directly in conservation or at least making people aware of how birding can help conservation. Um, and then earlier I mentioned binoculars. Um, I think optics are so important um, with getting people into this hobby. Um, so if I can get more binoculars um, for staff for the community, for kids. Um, I think it would just help everyone see things. And I think it's something that's super doable um, for the zoo um, to put their resources into that would have um, some long-term success. 
And that's it for me. If anyone has questions, I'm ready to answer them. Yeah, thanks, Anton. That's awesome. 125 species. I know I never saw close to that. <laughs> that that's that's crazy. So yeah. we, we did have one question come in. Anne asks, um, do you know if the Denver Zoo has like a checklist for birds that have been seen on grounds? Uh, or is their best bet going to be to go to eBird and kind of do a hot spot? What do you think as far as that yeah, goes? Yeah, eBird right now is the best place. Um, we keep track of the birds from the Christmas bird count, but it's not public at all. Um, sure. So eBird for now, um, we have talked about um, creating a list of birds like on a whiteboard somewhere, um, like a lot of um, big birding hotspots have so that people can add what they see. Um, but we're not there yet, but hopefully, hopefully one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's one, I think that's one nice part about having the zoo and city park there and so accessible is that you can learn that environment and so you can see those birds change through the season and that so glad to hear that from you because I always thought that was one of the cool things of being in that area and being able to go out even you know even for 15 minutes a day to go down you know seeing creepers and all the waterfowl and all this cool stuff in that in that very urban habitat you know that oasis so yes absolutely um and you just, you never know what you're going to see. I think it's the craziest thing, like um, sap suckers. And like you said, the creepers and stuff, like things that or the white throated sparrows that we just saw, there's things that shouldn't necessarily be there, but it's yeah. an oasis, like you said. And so um, it's a it's a haven for a lot of species. It's really cool. Um, and yeah, I want people to see all those, all those different seasons because it's so different depending on when you, uh, when you go. Do you, so we have a question about binoculars and that that can be a very long discussion. And there's lots of kind of resources on the web that probably, you know, if you really want to do a deep dive into binoculars and optics, that would be your best bet. But do you have any suggestions for like a, a good quality, like entry level binocular for people? Yeah, I, I personally like the Vortex ones because I just feel like it's a good balance of cost, but quality. Um, yeah. So I have a, I have like a medium um, price range for them, but um, those have been um, a lot of what we have bought recently um, in small amounts. And I just think that they're, again, that balance. And then also it's nice that they have like a lifetime warranty um, in case yeah, they get broken. I <laughs> That's what my wife and I have changed to the the vortex personally because it is a it's a nice kind of entry level binocular for when you're getting serious about being able to see things and they come in a nice range of sizes and you know um, objective lens sizes and stuff like that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I don't think we see any more questions. There was um, there was oh, one. Ahead, yeah, sure. There was one at the beginning, and this goes back to, I think, something, Anton, you were discussing pretty early on about a path being destroyed. Um, uh, and the question, it's not clear um, what Anton meant by that and the house being closed. Um, if you want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so our, uh, our, bird, will, our bird world building, um, a lot of people called it the bird house. Um, actually closed down in 2019. Um, and so it was built in the 70s. It had a lot wrong with it. Um, and it was going to be millions of dollars to um, fix it, which is not um, the path that the zoo had planned on going. And so um, it was initially planned on being open a little bit longer, but the repairs just got um, worse. So that building was um, shut down. And um, part of that area where that pollinator pathway was, um, was a part of that and it's now fenced off. Um, they're currently building a new Australia exhibit in that area. Um, so um, there's going to be a lot um, of different landscaping within this year, um, but birds are not gonna be the focus of that area. Um, the cassowaries are gonna get a new home um, and hopefully the kias will get a new home in the future, but um, we do not have a, 
um, just bird only um, indoor building anymore, unfortunately, which I don't like, but um, <laughs> money is a money is an issue. <laughs> Definitely. And, and if I can ask another question then too, um, do you all then have like organized bird walks? And I can imagine uh, the Denver Zoo kind of really lends itself to like bird ability, um, you know, uh, really um, kind of easy access for um, birders. Yeah. So we, we don't have regularly scheduled ones. Like it's not like a weekly thing, even though that's what I want to be a thing in the future. And I think it's super doable. And I think we have a lot of people in uh, management positions now who are interested in birding that it could become a thing. Um, but we do try to participate in different events. It's not always the same ones. So um, we have participated in like, um, like my migratory bird day and um, I don't know, different, different awareness days will bring people and let them in for birding. Sometimes we'll even get let people in um, in the morning before the zoo is open, since obviously in the warmer months, bird, birding is going to be better early in the day. Um, so I want to expand that. Um, but right now it's kind of limited, but has so much potential. Um, we also have um, our Duck Lake Overlook area, um, which um, camps and like different small um, youth groups can use, but it's not um, fully open 100% of the time. You do have to have like a staff member there with you, um, but they have been trying to get kids to just play more in that area. And then they show them kind of what what's living over there, which is kind of cool. Thanks. And I, I wanted to add in this, it was not a question, but a comment. Um, when Barbara said, I just wanted to say thanks. I so enjoyed your enthusiasm and how you are sharing it with different groups of new birders. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. It's uh, really oh, fun to you be able to talk to you up. guys. That was excellent. Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, with that we can wrap it up. Um, yeah. Thanks again, Anton, for coming yeah. to join us. This was wonderful. We really appreciate it. 